Heraclitus said, the road up and the road down are one and the same. War is the father of all and the king of all. There is attunement of opposite tensions, like that of the bow and of the harp. It sounds like a pointless riddle at first, but as you may already know, it makes very, very good sense. And if you don't know, you'll see what I'm saying in a second here. In the second half of this video, we're going to dig deeper into the practical application of the union of opposites, specifically individuation through the process of embodying the logos. Again, we're talking about Carl Jung's favorite thing ever here, the union of opposites, especially and specifically the pattern of heaven joining with earth, which can be something as high and beautiful as uh, theosis to the Orthodox or salvation to the Protestants and Catholics or individuation to Jungians, but can also be something as relatively small as an engineer applying a math equation in the process of building a bridge. Now let's get back to the conversation between Mathieu Peugeot and Jordan Peterson. I have such a hard time pronouncing his name, Mathieu, Mathieu Peugeot, about the most foundational pattern found in the symbolic language used in pre-modern humans, joining heaven and earth. Oh, and make sure you stick around to the last section. In that last section, we're going to cover the method that Christ gave to become the goat, the greatest of all time, essentially, using the process of enantiodromia. And I do believe that that's a reflection of the deepest instinct that we have. It's, it's much deeper than, than mere cognition or, or mere semantic and propositional content. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a, what we want basically, I think, is knowledge, what I call knowledge in my book, which is we're looking for a union of meaning and fact. We're not satisfied with just meaning. We're not satisfied with just things or facts. But then when there's a perfect joining of these uh, realms, that's what we're looking for as humans. That's what I think. Like That's what we strive for. We strive to understand abstractly things, and then we strive to concretely express them. Like just just understanding a concept is is not much, and then you have to express it in in reality in concreteness, and you even have to experience it. So I think this is something that's a little bit missing in science, um, in general, like modern science, the concept of experiencing knowledge for personally experiencing a principle. So it's always about describing the outer world. So it's not enough to have a scientific understanding of, say, the way crops grow and what plants need to thrive. This higher knowledge that resides, let's say, in the heavenly, needs to be embodied, so to speak, put into action. This higher meaning must be lowered and matter lifted up. Taking this knowledge and putting it into proper action is a minor microcosmic form of joining heaven and earth. Tilling the soil, fertilizing it with manure, watering the plants you sow into the ground. This is a joining of heaven and earth in a symbolic sense. Higher knowledge embodied through action. This is why Jonathan Peugeot, Jordan Peterson, his brother Matthew, Matthew Peugeot, however you say his name, I always forget, uh, stresses the importance of not only aiming, but also taking action, pulling the trigger. We all know that it's wise to aim at the highest thing you can conceptualize. Some call that highest thing God or Christ. The believers say that to describe a being. Jungians do to describe the archetype of the self. But how do you know when you're aiming properly? As we ascend the ladder, then we become what's at that ladder. It's not just a question of, of arbitrary judgment or arbitrary or like you did this and you didn't do this. It's, it's to become something. It's to acquire a virtue. And so and as you acquire virtue, then you become that which is at that level, right? And, and, and you become more and more in the image of God. Right? So it's a, it's, it's a process of transformation of the person. It's not just a bunch of rules you have to follow. 
in order to go to heaven or to go to hell. It, it's, that's, not, that's not it. It's to become something. And what you become, that's paradise itself. Right? To acquire the virtue is paradise. Jacob's Ladder? Yeah, so, but I think it's, it's another example also of if you look at these stories, these ancient stories with the wrong perspective, they, they look completely arbitrary and random and as if they were just inventions, pure inventions. But if you use just the basic categories of, of these cosmologies themselves, then they become pretty self-evident. Like, why, why is there a ladder between heaven and earth? I mean, if you're thinking materially, why is there a ladder between heaven and earth? It doesn't make any sense. But if you think in terms of a, an ancient cosmology where everything is based on the idea of heaven joining earth, then obviously there's a ladder between heaven and earth. And Well, and a relationship between the abstract and the concrete and a relationship between the infinite and the finite and, and the relationship between the psychological and the material. And that has to be a, a structure with some intermediary levels. Yeah. Yeah, that, exactly, yes. Now, I, I want to give you a little bit more of a background on what they're talking about here, because they don't really explain this very well, at, at least uh, not in these little clips. Uh, feel free to skip ahead to the PRAC app if you're not interested in this theory. Um, basically, the theory that uh, pre-modern humans understand things a, a lot better than we thought. Um, ancient civilizations like the Egyptians and Israelites, for example, and also closer to modern humans like the alchemists, uh, medieval priests, philosophers, etc. The grimoires they wrote, the fairy tales, old wives' tales, legends, superstitions, myths of gods and angels and demons, these were often rooted in very meaningful and insightful truth using a symbolic language used to express higher meaning. Now, Peugeot's book, The Language of Creation, which is a very interesting read, by the way. I highly recommend it. it his book gives a, a good on understanding of how pre-modern humans thought and understood reality and explained it, right? Uh, to summarize the idea in my own words, ancient cultures used symbols, stories, rituals, and religious practices to communicate and make sense of their experiences. Their symbols, like heaven and earth, amongst many others, were not silly, magical fairy tales or primitive misunderstandings of the nature of reality, but rather vessels of deep, literal meaning and patterns existing in the world and cosmos as a whole. Pre-modern cultures engaged in a type of symbolic th thinking that allowed them to navigate and interpret the world in a holistic manner. This Holistic think thinking encompasses the recognition that the physical and the metaphysical realms are intertwined. It involves acknowledging that there are deeper layers of reality beneath the surface level and that symbolic language and practices can provide access to these deeper realms of meaning and understanding. They saw patterns in different aspects of reality connecting the microcosm to the macrocosm. And this symbolic worldview provided a framework for understanding the mysteries of life, death, creation, and even the divine. Okay, back to the conversation on heaven joining with earth. How do you know you're not just imposing your arbitrary interpretation on a set of stories? And, and then how do you know that your arbitrary interpretation just doesn't serve your need and motive for the expression of power? And those are good questions. You could say the same about science too. I mean, anyone who claims to have a theory about reality, you could say, how do you know it's not just in your head? I mean, you could say that about anything. <laughs> the answer is the same. How do you know you experiment? And you prove that your uh, your your ideas and your theories are explain the phenomenon. It's the same thing in a story. If you, you you say this is all about a certain pattern, that's like your your theory. Well, I can prove it to you. I'll show. I'll read the story and I'll show you that it's always an expression of this pattern. So you prove it in exactly the same way as science proves its theories. You can also prove it the same way that Kierkegaard and the existentialists, existentialists insisted. And I would say this is basically an act of faith, which is you can take the pattern, you can act it out in the world. 
You can use it to govern your perceptions and to rule your actions, and then you can see what happens in your life. And I think a lot of, a lot of the injunction in the Bible in relationship to faith isn't the command to accept a certain description of reality at the propositional level, but to act in accordance with this divine cosmology, and then to, to see the manifestation of that, that's the fruits, right, by which the tree is known, to see the manifestation of that decision to act and perceive in that manner in the world. Carl Jung said, anyone who wants to know the human psyche will learn next to nothing from experimental psychology. He would be better advised to abandon exact science, put away his scholar's gown, bid farewell to his study, and wander with human heart throughout the world. There, in the horrors of prisons, lunatic asylums, and hospitals, in drab suburban pubs, in brothels and gambling hells, in the salons of the elegant, the stock exchanges, socialist meetings, churches, revivalist gatherings, and ecstatic sects through love and hate, through the experience of passion in every form in his own body, he would reap richer stores of knowledge than textbooks a foot thick could give him, and he will know how to doctor the sick with a real knowledge of the human soul. Take the story, act it out, and stress test it. See if it helps you overcome the insuperable obstacle and see if it protects you from nihilism and despair and see if it orients you properly in relationship to yourself and other people and see what it does with your relationship with women and, and, and with children and with your parents. And you can test the story that way. And as far as I can tell, the Bible it is the compilation of stories that have been tested in that way. Yes, exactly. Yes, you, you can test it within the text to know if, if your interpretation of the text makes sense within the text. And like you said, that's even a higher level, I would say. You could test it with reality, and then it's another story. And, and if, you start to, if you know the Bible very well and you understand the stories, you, you, you might start to discover that the patterns that are described in the Bible will also, are also happening to you all the time, whether you want it or not, by the way. <laughs> yes, well, this is something Jung pointed out. You know, he said, look, whether you know it or not, you're in the grips of a myth. And he meant a story. And you better figure out what the myth is because it might not have the ending you want. We all know aiming at this highest point, the peak of the mountain, the golden tip of the pyramid, whatever you want to call it, it's the most important thing we could ever do. But which of your actions and habits, and remember, habits ultimately form your character and your character determines your destiny. Which of those habits qualifies as you aiming at the highest and embodying it, mimicking it clumsily at first, but better and better as you practice? Here's an action to put your aim at the highest into action. Create a list of those habits. In the process, do your best to answer the question, which of my habits serve the highest telos, the greatest purpose imaginable? If you're like me, it'll be much shorter than you'd like, but it is what it is. The fool precedes the master. Next, create a list of the heaven aiming and embodying habits you see in others. Your heroes, peers, friends, family members, Ask yourself, if I successfully build these habits and continue these previous habits properly, what will my life look like in five years, 10 years, 20? And the more detail here, the better. Within reason, obviously. And there you have it. That is your blueprint. That's the X on your treasure map. Revisit this list and aim from month to month, year to year. And we'll talk about the day-to-day -day soon. Update it as needed as you grow older and wiser with a better understanding of what true success looks like. Now here's why aiming matters. So in this process, and the process of building your habits and carrying them out, you're keeping your sights set on the highest things imaginable throughout. And that's the hardest part. 
by far, keeping your sights true and maintaining that aim. When I was a young Marine learning marksmanship in the Marine Corps, learning it the Marine Corps way, right, me and the rest of us, they would have us sit or lay or stand in one of the positions for hours on end, doing nothing at all but aiming. A lot more goes into aiming than you might think or notice at first glance. And it's not the aiming that's difficult so much as maintaining that aim as long as you need to. Positioning your body correctly, wrapping your sling around your arm properly to stabilize the weapon, keeping the buttstock firmly planted in the pocket of your shoulder and your grip high on the pistol grip, hands placed just right as you keep your breathing slow and steady, almost like meditating because something as microscopic as your heart beating too heavily or your nerves wound a little too tightly is more than enough to send your shot off course. And that's all before even taking into account windage, slow and steady trigger pull, and distance. Maintaining the proper aim throughout took severe discipline and months and months of practice before I could even qualify as a sharpshooter, let alone expert, which took well over a year of dedicated practice. And that's just to put rounds down range, properly in a controlled environment. Close quarters combat is an entirely different and infinitely more complex world with much more severe ramifications, but aiming at the highest, this is light years beyond a rifle qualification or even a firefight in terms of consequences. Because in a firefight, worst case, you die. Your aim at the highest points you to and brings you to heaven or hell. And I'd rather die than live a life in the abject misery of hell, whether we're talking metaphorically or otherwise. Your day-to-day -day aim determines your destiny. So how do you keep your aim true? How do you maintain your aim? Well, listen to your intuition, of course, right? Your heart, and your noose, perhaps, as the Orthodox say, listen to yourself, listen to the Christ, listen to God. It takes discipline to pull your focus away from the lower things and to hold your focus on the highest, but it pays utterly priceless dividends. To hold your aim true consistently, not just each month when you review your goals or vision, not just every week, but every day and throughout the day, you can take these actions to keep your sights set on that apex of being. Ask yourself the questions above multiple times throughout the day, especially first thing in the morning and last thing before you sleep. Review those habits you identified and ask yourself, am I staying true to what I believe is the highest? Review your weekly, monthly, yearly goals every day at those same times and visualize what your life would look like if you stuck to those beneficial habits long term, but also what your life would look like if you missed the mark and allowed your vices or lower desires to pull your sights downward. You can do this during the same times each day as well. And what that does basically is it gives you both the positive reinforcement and the negative. So we started with Heraclitus, and now we're going to bring that full circle with this one last method, and the best method, based on my reading of his philosophy, but more importantly, a key method from Christ himself. The road up and the road down are one and the same. That's similar to saying that cold and hot are opposites, but they're both temperature and are the same in that sense. And like day and night, order and chaos, heaven and earth, those opposites give meaning and life to one another in some real sense. And too much of one leads to the other. And there's a reason we have sayings like, don't be so heavenly minded that you are of no earthly good. Or what about when Solomon says in Ecclesiastics, do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? And he also says, whoever fears God will avoid all 
extremes. So Solomon he said this because he understood enantiodromia. But while this warns against the negative version of enantiodromia, there's also turning lead into gold, right? There's the positive version, which you'll see in the method of becoming the greatest of all time, basically. But the, the method that Christ reveals to his disciples, which we'll cover in a minute. Now, in this never-ending war between the opposites, too much of one opposite always leads to the other opposite, right? Too much order always turns into chaos. Too much chaos turns into order, right? If you have a too much order in society, you have a tyranny that society will rise up against the tyrant and bring them down and it's going to cause chaos initially, almost always, right? That's the principle of enantiodromia, uh, demonstrated by the tension of the bow or strings of the harp, like we discussed earlier, uh, which always seek equilibrium after being pulled. The tension within which you find the logos, by the way, the unifying and organizing force of coherence in the world, the source of all meaning, and within the philosophy of both the early and modern Christian church, the God who is the source of all things that is in all things, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, uh, the top and the bottom of the hierarchy encompasses all things. And this is the key, the Logos. And the one simple thing you need to do to make sure you unite the opposites as much as possible in the best way as possible to join heaven and earth is to aim properly at the Logos, which is the highest. Aim at the highest things you can conceptualize, the highest, purest, strongest forms of truth, of love, wisdom, excellence, the most useful, helpful things for you and for your family and for others. And interestingly enough, perhaps not too surprisingly at this point, to achieve the highest thing imaginable requires becoming the lowest in some strange philanthropic version of enantiodromia. Think about what Christ said to his disciples when they asked uh, basically how to become the goat, the greatest of all time. He said, whoever humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And also, when they were arguing over who would be the goat in Luke, right? Who, who, they were arguing over who was going to be the greatest. Um, which is funny, but, you know, Jesus doesn't even shoot him down. He doesn't rebuke them or anything like that. He says, whoever is the least among you, whoever is the least among all of you, he is the greatest. And also, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve. So the ultimate self-overcoming and exercising the will to power to become the greatest, the ubermensch, is to serve people to the best of your ability. That is to serve everyone you possibly can in the best way possible. And what does it mean to serve but to give? I mean, those who serve give their time, they give their energy, their money, etc. They're givers. So to become the greatest, to become the overman, the ubermensch, you have to become the greatest giver. And that's the final method to aim properly at the highest actions, to join heaven and earth, to unite the opposites. You aim at becoming the greatest by asking yourself, how can I lower myself beneath even the lowest around me to help raise them up in some way? How do I become the greatest giver I possibly can be? What habit of giving do I have currently? What habit of giving can I have? Is it the most efficient and effective way to give? How many do I lift up in this process? How many could I help if I were truly great, as in truly noble, truly competent, humble but with healthy pride, financially frugal but generous, leading fearlessly but serving with a healthy fear slash respect of some archetypal life judge like the Christ, the Logos himself, the Logos that you see in them. This is what brings true greatness and thus true happiness. 
becoming the highest by becoming the lowest. And there you have it. That's all I have for you guys today. I hope you have an amazing day. Uh, if you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.